I'm feeling a lot better about the Yankee gutter when I see this much copper. Now we got ourselves a real gutter. A big hot water demand requires a big solution, and it comes in this small package. What happened to all this plumbing here? I've never seen anything like this before. There's already rot going on in that trunk. So what have you found up here? Well, a bit of a surprise. It's really the classic plumber's lament. Nice. It's five bathrooms, it's a kitchen, it's a full new mechanical. It's, it's going to be a biggie. Sounds like you guys have a plan. I think we do. <laughs> Money's in the detail. That is beautiful. and welcome back to this old house where we are working on a beautiful Queen Anne Victorian here in Narragansett, Rhode Island, which is a town that has a rich history as a resort summer community going all the way back to the mid-19th century. Our house was built in 1887 and right here in the historic district. So that means that the commission has some say on how it looks, and they would love for it to look just like it did back in the 1880s. So they are very particular about all the details, right down to the gutters. When we first saw the house, the roof had old-fashioned Yankee gutters on it. And that's one of the features we're required to restore. Hey, Chris. Hey, Kevin. So this is uh, the Yankee gutter. This is what we're putting back, huh? Yes. How'd you make that out of? We made it out of some treated lumber that we ripped. Yeah. And we put these brackets on to set it at the angle of the roof. Well, there really is not much to it, right? I mean, no. when they say Yankee, they were talking frugal, weren't they? Mm. So I'll be honest with you. These were on the house when we got here, and I'm a skeptic. <laughs> they don't seem to do much. Well, they look good covered in copper. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and they just seem to push the water to the side. Anyway, it doesn't manage the water. But we've got to put them on, uh, so we'll do our best job at that. And the Historic Commission says on the old house, which is right, right. here, do yes. we need to put them on the addition? Nope. The new, all the new building is going to be regular gutters. Ones that work? Yes. Awesome. All right. <laughs> I've got my tools. I'll give you a hand. Let's go up. Okay, so Chris, tell me how you prepped for this. Well, we first have the waterproof membrane right. on top of the sheathing. Yeah. And there's a copper drip edge. Oh yeah. Runs around. On the rake in the front here. Got a starter course, then the first course of shingles, and this is our second course where we're going to lay the gutter. I see a line right here, uh, and when you say lay the gutter, we're just going to go right on top of this asphalt shingle. Correct. And we're going to screw through this into the roof. Yes. So you want this center line lined right up with that oh, hash yeah. mark. Okay, so you get the, yep, yeah, I'm good there, and I'm good with the uh, horizontal line as well. Okay. I'm still on lines, good to go. It's kind of crazy to drill right through a roof, but this is self-adhering, self-sealing? Yes. And you got a... Uh, Six inch. Six inch threaded bolt there. I'll get this one on the end. Can this guy come out? Yes. Now this gutter is pitched to your end, and that's where the downspout's going to go, so we've got to drill the downspout hole. So you've got a mark and a hole there already. Just right through it. All right, I am through the uh, layers of asphalt, Chris. I'm down to the uh, self-adhering membrane, and I'm into the wood. That is the planking from the original house, so we are through. All right, so flashing, I presume? 
Yes, we've got a piece of copper that's going to run the length of this. It's got a downspout. It's going to go right through that hole. Yep. We'll tack it on, roll some Vicor across the top of that. And good to go. You think the old Yankees use copper? Uh, not on this one. Not on this one. All right. It's going right over your head. Look at you. Okay. There's that little downspout. Put that right through. Oh, this is a nice, nice job. Look at the way it just wraps right over that. It goes right through the hole. I'm feeling a lot better about the Yankee gutter when I see this much copper. Now we got ourselves a real gutter. Solder joints. So Chris, on the original one, I don't even remember seeing a hole through the roof, and I certainly didn't remember seeing anything coming down from the roof. What's our plan here? Well, we're going to have a downspout on these. Connected underneath to the side here? Correct. Down to the ground? Yes. All right, we're getting better with every uh, pass. And you just handed me, what'd you hand me here? Some copper roofing nails. Yep. And we're going to nail about one inch down, about every 16 inches. So you're good right there. Okay, what next? Well, we're gonna use our rubber membrane. We're gonna come down about halfway. Okay, nine and a half, four and three quarters. So I get better about, feeling better about this every inch of the way, Chris. Copper, now a membrane. <laughs> this might actually work. <laughs> First time in 130 years, they're gonna have working gutters. Thank you. Good here. Good? Yep. All right, and so this is a self-adhering membrane as well, right? Yes, so the roofers can put their asphalt shingles right on top of that and nail right through it. Beautiful, so we got asphalt underneath, we got copper in the middle, we got the membrane right here, asphalt on top of it, drains out here. The new Yankee gutter, this one might actually work. All right. <laughs> I love it. It's actually a cool look. Our Generation Next initiative this year deals with the electrical trades, and our apprentice is working with Ben Giles, who is Jeff Sweeney's go-to electrician. They're working here in the back room. Hey, Zach. Hey, Ben. Hey, how's it going, Kevin? All right. What are we working on today? So we just started this job the other day, uh, and we're actually on this floor. We're boxing and drilling, kind of getting ready to pull some wires. Boxing and drilling, yep. meaning setting the outlet and uh, receptacle boxes? Yeah, so we've laid out where everything's going to go. Yep. And so we know where all the outlets and switch boxes and kind of approximately where the lights are going to go. So now we're going to start setting these boxes. Uh, we're going to drill some holes so that we're ready to pull wire through those holes gotcha. and get the room done. And Zach, you've been at this uh, for a few weeks now with Ben. Have you done this um, type of work yet? Was... Yeah, a few times. Yeah. Um, yesterday, actually, we were working on a job where I was practicing putting some boxes in, so I'm a little bit familiar with it. Good. Well, then you can show me what to do, because you probably know more about it than I do at this point. Uh, where do you want to get started, and what can we do? So why don't we set some boxes? Um, the way that we do that, uh, just to keep it simple, we want to make sure that everything's perfectly level because you never know if there's going to be some sort of wood detail on the wall or whatever that you want to be able to see that every box is level. We're going to set this on the ground, okay? We're going to put the box on it, and you see the box has these little sheetrock. Yep. Uh, little nubs right nubs, there. Nubs, yep. We're Sets going to set depth. that, set depth and height. And then shoot it home. And do me a favor, Ben. Take that um, your gauge away and tell me what your markings mean. I got two indicators there. Right. So this is the this is the outlet marking. Sort of like any any set of prints that you look at. That's going to be what you see when you look at a set of prints for an outlet, a yeah. typical 15 amp outlet. Okay. 
And this is just telling whoever's hanging the boxes after I go through and lay out the job, I want the box on this side of the gotcha. stud. Simple enough. So as you go around the room, everything winds up on the same side that I would like it on. Right height, right type of device, right type of box, the whole bit. Let's get to it. All right. <laughs> Brace the drill well, drill right in the center and try and keep it nice and straight. Outside, this house maintains its historical integrity. Inside, we're planning nothing but state of the art. And that includes our water heater. You know, if you got a typical house, it's pretty straightforward what size water heater you need. You put a tank type water heater in, it's a bathroom or two and a kitchen, end of story. But in a house like this that has a big tub, maybe a jetted tub, and body sprays and hand showers and all the like, you really have to be careful because it starts to add up. Now by code, a body spray like this can be no more than 2.5 gallons per minute. But it doesn't say how many you can actually put into a house. So if you had four of them, Four times two and a half gallons is what? 10 gallons a minute. And you got to assume a shower is going to be 10 minutes. That means you need 100 gallons of hot water ready to go uh, just for the body sprays, not even counting the tub. And that's in one shower. So 10 gallons a minute, somebody takes a 10 minute shower, that's 100 gallons of hot water you need to go right then. So many people would just put in a, t a big tank type water heater or two. Uh, we've seen two and three. Now that means that those tanks sit hot 365, 24-7 all the time on the off chance that somebody would use those body sprays or the big tub and there's an energy penalty for that. But we're going to do something different. We're going to use an instantaneous tankless water heaters. Here's a single one right here. We're going to manifold them together. So here's what the unit looks like on the outside. We've seen these before. They're used all over the world. You can see right here at the top there's a combustion air fan and a gas valve. Air and gas come into the top of this heat exchanger right here. Now it's going to drive, the burners right at the very top, it's going to drive heat down through. At the same time, you've got cold water that comes into the top of this heat exchanger, passes back and forth through the heat exchanger, comes out down to the next heat exchanger, secondary one, then the heated water leaves and goes out to the system right here. The heat exchanger right here will help you understand what's going on inside. Here's that combustion air and fan. If you lift this off, you'll see the burner. Now see this? It's a mesh burner. Now there's no visible flame that sticks out like the old days. This will just glow right here. And then the fan will push the air and gas across this to change its output. The flue products go down through this stainless steel thinned heat exchanger right here. The water's going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The flue products come down through. The heat gets transferred into the water. The water will come down to a lower heat exchanger. Now the lower heat exchanger, you can see it right here, it's going to extract even more temperature and the water, the heated water will then go out to the building. Now the only byproduct that's left is a little bit of flue gas temperature and some water. And right here you can see there's a condensate pan that catches the water and sends that water out to the drain. So that's how a single device works, but we're going to actually have three working together here. In order to do that, the system has to have some smarts. Each one of the units has this metering device right here for the cold water, and you can see this control right here. The control on each of these units will communicate through the brain right here. Now what happens is, it figures out now who's going to do the work. If somebody opened just a faucet in the kitchen with a very low demand, one of the units would come on, modulate the burner, and put out just the right amount for that really low demand. But as more and more demands happens, it'll figure out the smartest way to have the units come on so it'll keep up with the demand and make sure that you don't notice it upstairs. The nice thing is, though, if when this system, nobody's using water at all, this system uses zero, unlike a tank-type water heater. All right, it is time to get started with this installation. Josh Jordan is our plumber. Josh, we're back in this awful basement. I try to forget it. Once again. <laughs> yep. All right. So you've got started? Yeah. Uh, well, they built an actually nice wall for us, yeah. and we have the unit mounted. All right. Um, we're going to mount two more of these, one on either side of it. Right. Uh, we've got the, the middle one up for now. All right. Uh, we have this big, beautiful manifold. 
So sort of a pre-engineered system looks like two inch copper right here and you got the tappings for the cold, the hot, you got a gas manifold there. And what's nice is these flexible connectors right here for cold, for hot, and for the gas. Beautiful. Yep. Smooth. All right, and what about venting? Uh, venting, we have, all three are going to get uh, common vented together in one concentric vent kit on the outside of the so house. only one thing you'll see on the outside yep. of the house. That's yep. what it would look like. Yep, this, it'll be this, but... Of course, Jeff's guys will cover that with yep. copper to make it look oh, like yeah, it Oh, yeah, it'll be beautiful there. when it's done. All right, cool. Um, they're all going to get common vented together. We have... Uh, a valve set up on top. So that's pretty ingenious. This has a backdraft damper in it. You know, you don't think much about it, but this is really important. You know, you got one unit firing into a common vent. You don't want the flue parts coming over into the other unit because I could CO and everything else could yep. make combustion go bad. Exactly. No CO that's problems great. at all. Really smart. Really well engineered. All right. Well, I will. Should I get out of your way so you can? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yep, I'm yeah. ready to take a shower. Yeah, we can uh, we can hang, get these other three hung, uh, the other two hung, and get rolling. All right, thanks as always, right. brother. Have a good day. This porch is a key feature of the house, and it's got a lot of these details that the Historic Commission says we have to save, like these posts, for example, and these corbels. Now, this corbel and all the ones behind me uh, were here when we got here, and it used to look like that. So those were fixed, uh, but we do have some new ones uh, that were replicated, one, two, and we've got a bunch more we got to replicate as well. So Tommy, how many more of these do we have to make? We have to make six more. I've got five here and one more to cut. All right, and this one um, could not be saved. It's got a really bad corner, but you were able to put it to good use and make it a template. Right, so the two things we want to save about this is we can get the thickness that we need yeah. and also the dimensions that we need, and we can transfer all of those measurements to this piece of wood right here. And that means that we put it down, we place it on here, we trace it, and then we have a template so we can match exactly our new corbels. So these are done, and what is the species of material? All right, this is Spanish cedar. It's two and a half inches thick. Now, Spanish cedar holds up very good for exterior wood. So this is not a glue up, that's actually the thickness. Solid right. wood, just like the original. Yeah. All right, so as you see, I've drawn a line right here, and to draw that, li to draw that line, I've used my template. So what I like to do is I actually take the template, instead of making it flush with this edge right here, I set it in just about an eighth of an inch, and I set it down about an eighth of an inch, just like that, and then I draw my line. And why do you set it in just a touch? Are you going to trim this up? I want to make sure that when I make a cut here, it doesn't come off the table, uh, the bandsaw wrong, or maybe I have a little trouble with my router. So you can fine tune it. I just can a fine touch. tune it later. So lines already drawn. Are we to the bandsaw? We're ready to the bandsaw. You want to cut this one? Yeah, sure. All right. Always push as you turn. You can just if you just come around here and then come right on. Yeah, so thick. Yeah. Nice and slow. Don't try to make your turn too fast. All right. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take our template and put it back on here because we didn't go beyond the line with the bandsaw. You did a nice job there. So I can put this right back on that line. I still have a little reveal here in the back. Put it on my line. Get a reveal at the top, all, all the way around. Now put a screw in here. And we'll finish this up with a trim router. Now, the router that we're gonna use is a straight cutting bit with a bearing right here. And this bearing will ride around this edge of our template right here, stopping the router from going in. So I turn it on, gently bring it in. And I'm gonna actually go the wrong way. Usually you'll pull the router going against the cutter, but in this case, I'm gonna go that way. So it's called running with the grain. 
attachment. So if the router will want to take off, so I want to make sure I hold it. Make a fine cut, easy. Now I can come back, I'm going to pull it in, let it fall against the bearing, nice and slow, hear the chattering of the bit. So we're taking a lot off with this little router. Go again. Not, I'm not tight against the template. I'm almost freehanding it. I'm going to go again. Whoop. We're gonna flip it and do the other half. Yep. All right, now we remove the template. And now we're gonna use a different router bit, only this time the bearing is on the end of the bit. And we'll take this router bit and run it using our new cut as a guide. We'll follow that and make it flush. I'm going to back prime the back side that's going to go up against the post and the trim because we'll never see that again. Okay, so that's prime. It's good. Now before we put it on, I'm going to run a little bead of caulking right down here, about a half an inch in from the edge. Do the top two. Okay, okay, now hold it up there. I want to pre drill a hole here in the bottom. Nice and tight. You got it? Push it up. There we go. Right, you watch around there. All right, good. We'll put this screw in. Let's get it right there. All right, we'll get some bungs, fill those up, sand them flush. Perfect match to what was on the house when we got here and a beautiful detail to add. That is awesome, yeah, Tommy. Good. Yeah, yeah, it looks real good. All right, so next time I've actually got to start talking about interior design with the homeowners. Yeah, and we're going to be doing those garage doors too. All right, well, you get all that and more. So until then, I'm Kevin O'Connor. And I'm Tom Silva. For this old house here in Narragansett. Uh, one more here in this corner. Just connect one wire there, touch the other terminal. Next time on this old house. There it goes. That's a beautiful thing. That motor will do it, but I think two is really going to work. Help. And you wouldn't want to make that, that gable and body one color, because there's just too much going on. Yeah, exactly. And if you want to see what's going on, the way you do that is with color. Right. This house is really elegant.